Good. Welcome again to the house of the Lord. You are some of the few in Canada that are still gathering. Bless you. I trust the Lord will bless you today. You know, he tells us to gather together. He calls us to gather together. And so today we do that in obedience to him with hearts anticipating what it is that he is going to teach us encourage us with today, and so I look forward to our time together. Welcome to those in the Christian Ed Building, those watching by YouTube, online. We are delighted to have you join us in this way. I want to start with reading a psalm, Psalm 23. We could probably quote it, but I'm going to read it to make sure I don't make any mistakes. What a blessed psalm in a time in which there is so much uncertainty. Listen carefully. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you. What a wonderful shepherd you are. And today as we, your children, gather here to worship you, we ask that you would guide our hearts, that you would season us with grace to respond to the call in our hearts as you would bless us today in your presence. Lord, you've called us to love you and love one another, and we want to do that today. Bless our time, I ask, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask Russ Bailey to come with his team and lead us in some singing. Listen to the words of Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Let's all stand, shall we, as we sing this one? I'm sure we all know this one well.
Thessalonians chapter 4 says for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more, and the morning brings eternal bright and fair. When the saints on earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll Are going to see the king. Alleluia. 
God hath prepared for them that love him. Amen. We've got one more song. It's my very favorite. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. <clears throat> what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day. Let's all stand and sing it once again. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Thank you very much. What a delight to sing together praises to the Lord. Children over in the Christian Ed building, you can be dismissed to Children's Church. And today, Mrs. Harmony Strauss will be your teacher. Trust that you'll have a good time there learning together what God has for you in Children's Church. We are going through a series here. Today's the last one. What do we believe? What should we believe? What does the Bible say we should believe? And, of course, that sometimes brings to people's minds, oh, that's going to cause disagreement. A lot of pastors don't want to teach about doctrine because it's going to divide people. But I suggest to you that if we all come to understand what Scripture says, it really will unite us if we can, can put our trust and our faith in what the Bible says and commit our life to following. It's very uniting. 
And so it's a matter of saying, what do I want to believe? Do I want to believe what I think? Do I want to believe what the culture is promoting? Or do I want to believe what the Bible says? We had an interesting conversation this week about some issues going on in churches with someone from another church, church board, and, and the, the way that our culture today is taking so much of Scripture and rationalizing it away is by saying, oh, that was the culture of that day. We have a different culture today. But I want to suggest to you that the Bible has its own culture, God's culture. This is the one that he calls us to follow. And yes, there are tolerances and there's margins for us to fit in the things of our own nationality and culture and the nation where we live, but boy, the Bible is God's culture for all the peoples of the land, all around the globe. And so that's what he calls us to. And so we're going through these beliefs. I'm not going to review all of them as we've gone through them in the past weeks, but today the last two. The last two. What about the future? And what do we do till then? What about the future? Certainly a point of relevance today as we see so many things unfolding in our country, in our neighboring country to the south. Much evil is rising uh, much polarization developing in our land. Uh, what does God have in store for the future? And on point 10 in our uh, list, there are things that we believe, and it's on our website. It says there, believe in the rapture of the believers prior to God judging the earth with a time of great tribulation and then the second coming of Jesus Christ to rule the earth for a thousand years years. There is much here that could be talked about. There's books and books and books written about this. And I want to suggest to you again that the way to come to clarity on these points is not whether or not I can fathom it, but do I actually believe what's written? And there's a lot of interpretation going on in these things. And I, again, take you back to one of the previous points. We believe in the scriptures is God's holy inspired word. We take it literally in the context in which it's written. And that's how we want to establish what we believe. Now, one of the most crazy of the things that God has predicted in terms of the human mind is the rapture. I mean, this is unbelievable to think that suddenly all those who are in the grave and alive are going to be swept up into the air to meet the Lord. Does that sound crazy? From a human point of view, it's, wow, really? From a believer's point of view, come soon. Oh, what a wonderful day. And so we have this teaching in Scripture, and I'm just going to read a little bit of some verses here, and then I'm going to go through a chronology of the major prophetic events from now until the new heaven and new earth very quickly, because I found in talking to young people, they have no idea. That hasn't been taught. And so how does the scripture lay out the, the events in chronological order? Let's see what we can learn. So first of all, some scripture. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. And uh, we can read it on the screen, I think. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Which also said this, ye men of Galilee... Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? These are the angels after Jesus ascended. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manners as you have seen him go into heaven. He just, whew, and we just read today. He'll be whew, coming back, and we will rise up like he did to meet him in the air. That's the next passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. I'm going to review some of Scripture, and then I'm going to go through these events in chronological order for you, just to give it a refresher for those of you who know it well, and for those who don't, there's lots of Scripture there that you'll be able to take with you and study further. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died... And rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, 
that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Can you hear that? All of them together. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. When we die as believers, our bodies are laid to rest. Our spirit goes to be with the Lord. This is a day of reunification between our spirit and our new bodies, just as Jesus demonstrated with his resurrection, a new body. And our spirit will again be reunited and we will have our new physical bodies and we'll meet the Lord in the air. Those of us who haven't died will have a translated body, a heavenly body that we will have for eternity. I don't know if I'll have more hair. I don't know if I'll still have the wrinkles and the bags under my eyes. I don't know. But I don't care because it's going to be an amazing body, one that was, would be beyond our imagination to understand that the Lord will give it to us. Then over in the next passage, Revelation chapter 20, the last pictures of what God has given for us to know about his plan, he has it all detailed, and he's given some of us, some of it, the details to us in his word. Revelation chapter 20, the, the, the picture of after a time of great tribulation, then the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is in um, the previous chapter 19. You can read it there. The, the Lord doesn't come to take us back with him to heaven on that picture. He comes to again conquer evil and set up his kingdom. They're two very different events. And in that passage, Revelation chapter 20, it says in verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones. And they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast. This is during the tribulation period. Neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again, until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. All right, let's go over to our position statement. I'm going to have you um, pick up one of these on the way out today because there's too much here to go over in detail. It looks like this. It's a position statement on the chronology of major events of prophecy. And on the other side will be details of the next, the last of our belief statements. Position statement. Let's go through these rather quickly. I don't have the time to do all the verses, but I'm going to give some background on some of these things where there is controversy. The rapture. We believe Scripture teaches that there will be a pre-wrath removal of Christ's bride. Why would the Lord want to take his bride through a time of wrath? It makes no sense. And so we believe in the rapture being pre-tribulation. I also want to suggest there in that document that there are a number of views. There's those who hold to a pre-tribulation rapture, those who hold to a mid-tribulation, those who hold to a post-tribulation. And it's not to be confused with the second coming of Christ. That is a separate event. So we have the rapture. Then we have the Bema, judgment seat of Christ. That is a, a scripture given to us that talks about how those who are believers will be rewarded for their service to the king. A time of rewards. You don't get into heaven by works, but the Lord is a perfectly just king, and he will reward his servants according to their service. The third one is the marriage feast of the Lamb. 
Jesus Christ and the church. Now, who's the church? The church are all those who became believers from the time of Pentecost to the time of the rapture. That's his bride. Who will be the guests at the wedding? Well, it'll be all those believers outside of that time from the time of Pentecost to the rapture. All the Old Testament believers, those who, who came to Christ during the time of the tribulation, those will be the guests. We'll, we'll, they'll, they'll get to watch those of us who are blessed to live in this time frame be married to the Lord himself. Of course, the parable of the ten virgins speaks of that. And there's lots that we could study there, but just want to mention that that's the next event going on in the heavens. Then we have the picture in Revelation chapter 5 of the crisis of the seven-sealed book. A book is taken out in heaven and it has seven seals. Who is worthy to open this book? And they look around heaven, no one is worthy. It's a crisis. Until they come to seeing Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, he paid the price. He is worthy. He is the one who has the power and authority from God the Father to, to open the book of seal, the seals and, and begin the process of judging those who rejected him. The crisis of the seven-sealed book. Revelation chapter 5. Then the tribulation. So that's back on earth now. The other events, the beam of seat, the marriage feast of the Lamb, and the crisis of the seven-sealed book is all happening up in heaven. And from the rapture, the Bible speaks about there'll be a small interlude and then the beginnings of the time of troubles. Tribulation. It's really a harvest time. It's a time in which God himself takes his people to be with him. And those who have sown tares, those who have sown sin and evil deeds will be judged for their activity. Time of great tribulation. Seven years. First three and a half, time of deception. The last three and a half, a time of great tribulation. It's all in Revelation chapter 6 to 19. Not easy reading. A lot of it we don't understand. But oh, it's there. And a lot of it needs Daniel to help understand it. So if you take the book of Daniel and take the book of Revelation, and if you can absorb all that, God bless you, there's a lot there to give us an idea of how God's thinking is about these final times. Then the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation, when the world will gather to exterminate God's people, the Lord will return with us following behind him. It speaks of that in Revelation chapter 19. And there'll be a coming of the Lord to deal with wickedness on the earth and then set up his kingdom. And then you have the establishment of the thousand-year reign of Christ, the millennial reign. Three major views, okay? Three major views here. One of them is post-millennialism. It suggests that Christianity will bring about the millennial kingdom. I just want to read a little bit of a summary here because this is where a lot of controversy develops. And it really is, again, a question of do you take the Bible literally or not? Postmillennialism. The theory says that through the preaching of the gospel, the world will eventually embrace Christianity and become a universal society of saints. At this point, Christ will be invited to assume command and reign over man's peaceful planet. Thus, Though postmillennialists believe in a literal thousand-year reign, their position is false, for the Bible clearly teaches that the world situation will become worse and worse prior to Christ's second coming, not better and better. We have that in the scripture where it talks about, as it was, Jesus said in Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the last day. This position was popularized a Unitarian minister named Daniel Whitby, 1638, but it really started way back about the fourth century with the Catholic Church and their whole mindset that said, we're going to see Christianity cover the earth, and that's what will that's we'll bring about the millennial time of Christ. It flourished until the early part of the 20th century. Then came World War I, and man began to wonder. And finally, the postmillennial theory was quietly laid to rest for most people amid Hitler's gas ovens during the Second World War. That's postmillennialism. Then we have amillennialism. This, is one's, this one's more popular today. It's an allegorical interpretation of Isaiah chapter 11, where we have the lion laying down with the lamb, and 
Revelation 20, where it describes it. This view teaches that there will be no thousand-year reign at all, and that the New Testament church inherits all the spiritual promises and prophecies of Old Testament Israel. In this view, Isaiah's beautiful prophecy of the bear and the cow lying together and the lion eating straw like the ox simply doesn't mean what it says, is the view. However, if the 11th chapter of Isaiah cannot be taken literally, what proof do we have that the magnificent 53rd chapter of Isaiah should not likewise be allegorized away? And of course, that's the passage of Christ dying for us, covering our sin, becoming our Redeemer and Savior. So the all-millennial view says no literal thousand year. The church replaces Israel, and there's a, it's amazing how much of this is abounding today in the Christian community. Um, it's just not there. The, the oldest view is the premillennial view. It was the literal interpretation of Scripture right from the time of the early church. This view teaches that Christ will return just prior to the millennial, millennium and will personally rule during this glorious thousand-year reign. This position alone is the scriptural one and is the oldest of these three views. I know that sounds dogmatic, but study your Bible. Don't reinterpret it. Just take it as it's written. And it is the oldest of these three views. From the apostolic period on, the premillennial position was held by the early church fathers. There's a whole list of them here that I could give you of the early church fathers. Clement of Rome, Ignatius, Polycarp, uh, then into the second century, Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, Tertullian, and then the third century, Cyprian and Commodianus. Um, beginning in the fourth century, however, the Roman Catholic Church began to grow and premillennialism began to wither. For Rome viewed herself as God's instrument to usher in the pr promised kingdom of glory. For centuries, the precious doctrine of premillennialism was lost except to a few groups. But in the fast, past few hundred years, God has graciously revived this teaching and restored it to its proper place using men like Alford and Sias and Darby and Schofield and others. Why does it matter? It's about hope. It's about hope. If you take the scriptures as it's written with the plan that God has for us, you have the amazing picture of faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. Without a proper understanding of these things, we, we miss what God has prescribed for us to enjoy, the promise of his coming, the promise of his reign, and the fact that we will reign with him. At the end of the millennial reign of that thousand years, moving along in history here, there is the time of Satan's final revolt. Again, he'll be released to practice his art of deception. He is a great deceiver the father of lies. And Revelation 20 talks about that. And then the great white throne judgment. At the end of that period, he'll be defeated. He'll be t totally wrapped up and thrown into the lake of fire. And there's this great white throne judgment where all of those whose lives have not yet been reviewed will be reviewed by God. And they will be tested as to whether they submitted to God or lived the way they wanted, being their own God. It's a great theological discussion. What about those who never heard of Christ? What are those who, who never heard the gospel? Did they live according to their inborn conscience in the fear of God? That'll be the test in the great white throne judgment, I believe. Then we have the destruction of the earth and physical heavens by fire, as per prophesied there in Hebrews and in 2 Peter, and then the new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem, part of it, and then the final picture of eternal worship and a perfect existence with God, Revelation 21 and 22. That's the chronology as I understand Scripture. That's the position that we take as a church in our doctrine and in our statement of values and beliefs. And I trust that for those of you who say, well, I never even investigated this before. I don't know what I believe. Well, take the scripture passages and read them. Study them. See what God has. I suggest to you that by understanding this, it will give you a clearer, a much clearer understanding of your purpose for being here. A lot of the younger people of today say, well, I don't know why I'm here. 
Why am I here? Well, God created each one of us for a purpose. Each one of us. Uniquely. And his purpose is to ultimately build his kingdom. And we have an opportunity to say, God, what part do I play in the building of your kingdom? As we see the picture of the kingdom coming to its full fruition through the prophecy, we'll understand that there's a blessed hope, a blessed hope that comes. And the promise of reward. Salvation by faith, but rewards for service. So if I've sat around lazily all my spiritual life, there won't be much reward. But if I serve the Lord diligently with my whole heart, God says, I'm a perfect and just God, I will reward you. That gives us motivation for service to him. All right, number 11. That was fast, huh? Are you still with me? That was fast, but I put it in document form. It's a position statement that I encourage you to study. Uh, It can change your outlook. It changes your sense of identity when you understand God's total picture of history. Number 11, what do we do in the meantime until all these wonderful things come to pass? What do we do in the meantime? We believe the church is to be active in worship, service, and missions until the Lord comes. Matthew 28, 18 and 20. Very famous passage of scripture Jesus gave to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. And you know, in that passage, there is so much there of our destiny and identity. It says there, sorry, verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke unto them, the disciples, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach. Here's the verbs. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Again, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age of the world, as that is translated in English here. End of the age. The, the picture here for us as God's people is that we are to be faithfully serving him with sharing the good news with others around us. This is why we have a school. This is why we have a WANA. This is why we have a counseling ministry. Not just to keep busy, but to share the teachings of Jesus with people, whoever will listen. Fulfilling our mission from God. I go over to Acts chapter 2, the New Testament church. How did they, how did they act with each other? Acts chapter 2. Verse 41 and 42, after a time of preaching there, it says that, they, they, that then they that gladly received God's word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I just want to clarify something. We don't baptize because we're a Baptist church. We baptize because that's what Scripture teaches. Now, for some reason throughout history and the evolution of man's thinking, The word Baptist has been attached to some churches and not to others. But the Bible's for all of us. They've got baptized. 3,000. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. That's what they did together. Hebrews chapter 10 gives us one further point of advice for us in the last days. Hebrews chapter 10 says there, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What's the day? The day of the Lord's return. I, I, I'm troubled. I scanned over a dozen churches this week. What's going on in your church? What's happening with services? What are you doing to still gather? And I was quite discouraged as I went through it. Most churches, you can almost put a closed sign up out on the street. That's direct disobedience to what God's told us. We're to gather. Now, if you're in Ontario and that's maximum of 10, well then, 10 gather. Many groups of ten. If it's six in some places, then gather with six. Whatever it is, gather. Why? To exhort one another. 
to comfort one another, to encourage one another. I know in some of the churches and in our community, there's very strict rules about gatherings. Well, you can go to a park. You can go outside for a walk and gather that way and encourage one another. And there's ways to gather. We're supposed to gather until the Lord comes. I want to just share these 10 points as sort of a further breakout of this concept of what do we do until the Lord returns. Until the Lord comes for his bride, us, the church, we are to do these 10 things. There's more. I just picked these 10. Gather regularly to exhort one another. Observe the Lord's Supper with his coming in mind. We're going to do that today. Love the believers and all people. We're commanded to love the believers and all people. Be patient. It's God's plan and timing, not ours. You know, some people will give up. Oh, I've waited so long. You know, they said that back in Paul's day. The Lord's coming soon. Why am I still waiting? Because it's the Lord. He's sovereign. It's his timing. Not mine. It, the fact that it hasn't happened yet hasn't violated his word. He never gave a specific day. He gave a season. He's given us prophetic events to see it's coming along quite close now. Live a separated life. Live a separated life. I'll let you look up the scriptures there. We are only strangers passing through. Even though we're human, just like everybody else is human, spiritually we have a different identity. We belong to a different kingdom than this kingdom. As Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Which kingdom are you in? His or this world? Live a separated life. Refrain from judging others. Oh boy, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. You know how many times we're kind of stamped with, oh, those Christians are so judgmental. I've learned something. I was talking to some of my family about my 22 years when I worked in the airline industry, and I've always been a total abstainer. I, I don't socially drink. I'm just, I just think there's way too much trouble than what it's worth. So that's my position. I don't condemn anybody else who does, but I'm just saying that that's my position. But I was amazed as to how many social events um, in my time in management and in the work that I did with Canadian Airlines, that I being the only abstainer in the room, it bothered them. Guys, don't worry about me. I'm fine. But it bothered them. How come you don't drink? Come on, what is your issue? They were so focused on me, they, I don't think they enjoyed their drink. <laughs> it, was, it was terrible. But I, I was amazed as to how when you just stand for something you have been convicted of by the Lord and you just hold that position, I'm not... I wasn't going around saying, well, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be. I didn't do that. I said, this is where I'm at. How just that stand brings conviction to people's lives. And often their own heart in conviction will be expressed by, you're judging me. And I, I want to be careful. I, I don't want to give that as an excuse. We ought not to be judgmental. Their, their life will be accountable before the Lord. But I know many times we have to somehow take those insults or those attacks and we have to process it. And we say, well, what does that mean? Did I, did I, was I judgmental? No, not necessarily. It may be just that your life is already a, a convictor of people's hearts. And I, I, I just challenge you just to love them. Love them, accept them as they are, and just keep your stand and watch what God will do. Anytime people are reacting to what is good and right, God's working. Pray it through. Watch what God will do. Then preach God's word. Many ways to do that. Comfort one another. Exhort, encourage, support one another. Seek to help people come to faith in Christ. People need help. They need to understand the truth, the gospel story. At times, we need to just pray. I, I remember when I accepted Christ as a 10-year-old boy, I was laying on the front seat of my dad's car. Um, 
There was no seatbelt rules in those days. And he was taking me to Vancouver General Hospital because I was in severe pain with an appendicitis problem. And on the way driving to Vancouver General down Oak Street there, he, he all of a sudden became convicted as a father. He said, what if this appendix ruptures and I lose my son? I've never, ever asked him of his relationship to the Lord. And I felt the car slowing down. I remember this as a 10-year-old boy. The car was slowing. I thought, come on, i got to get there. And the car was slowing down, slowing down. And finally he pulled over. And he said, David, I have something to ask you. Do you mind if I ask you? I said, well, I was crying because I was in pain. And, and he said, have you ever asked the Lord Jesus to be your personal Savior? And my crying changed. Not from pain anymore, but to conviction. And I said, no, I haven't. And he said, why not? I said, I don't know. It's a struggle. I don't know. And he said, would you like to do that now? I'd love to help you. And at that spot on Oak Street, on the way to Vancouver General, my father prayed with me to accept Christ. That's the kind of help we can be part of. God used my father to help me make that decision just by a simple series of questions. And sometimes we need to do that. If the Holy Spirit prompts that with our family and friends, with people we know, we need to respond and say, okay, I'll obey. I don't know what my dad was thinking, like, well, what if he reacts or what if he rebels? You know all these concerns we can have about the way their response could go? But he just did what his heart and the Holy Spirit in him was telling him to do, and I'm grateful that the Lord used him to bring me to that point. And then lastly, set our affections on things above rather than on things on the earth. That needs to be our daily reminder. Our daily reminder. Oh, we can get worried about the house, we get worried about the car, we get worried about the insurance rates, and we, yeah, they are necessities of life. I need new clothes, I've outgrown my clothes, or my clothes are, have shrunk. You know, that happens when you get older. The clothes shrink. I need new clothes. And, and we need to take care of those things, but don't set your heart on them. They're temporary. They're temporary. Set our affections on things above rather than on things in the earth. That's 10 things that we can keep busy with until the Lord comes. Enjoy walking with him. I trust that as we've reviewed these values and beliefs that we hold to as a body here, that it maybe, maybe it'll challenge you to really think through, what do I believe? What am I really solid on? And I encourage you to pick up this document, position, statement, and chronology of major prophetic events at the welcome desk afterwards, and also these 10 things that we can be looking at. And if people are watching online, just email us, and we'll be happy to email it to you. The, all the scriptures are listed there. You can go through them. You can study them for yourself. And on top of it, there's all kinds of other books. I love reading Dispensational Truth by Clarence Larkin. This goes back. Oh, this was, this is online now. You can actually get all of these diagrams. It was done in 1918. But all these diagrams, that, and all listed there showing all the different things of prophecy. A great Bible study tool. This one is a favorite of mine, Wilmington's Guide to the Bible by Dr. Harold Wilmington. Again, this one is 1970s, I think it is, uh, printed. But some great tools, lots of online tools. Um, another one that I found quite helpful, even on the topic of the rapture, is Rapture Ready website. Rapture Ready website, if you want to go to that one. And uh, Dr. J. Randall Price does some excellent studies on the various views of tribulation and, and the millennial theology as to where the scripture stands on that. Um, be careful that you're not deceived. So much of what the Bible has printed for us is being reinterpreted today to fit in with our thinking as we want it today rather than what God prescribed for us to think like. And so I challenge you to study 
scriptures. And where I'm off, come and challenge me. I'd be happy to work through the Bible with you and see what it is that we can learn further. God has a plan. He loves each person. He came to deal with the sin problem in each of our lives and throughout his creation. He came as a savior in human form as a little baby, then as a carpenter, then as a rabbi teacher, doing miracles, reaching out to people. And then he was accused by the very people who were supposed to be religious. And they put him on a cross and put him to death. He paid the price as the great sacrifice, the one and only sacrifice as a human being for the condition of sin that we have in our lives. And, and today it's simple. Acknowledge you're a sinner. Acknowledge that you need a savior. You can't do it out of your own works. And that as you put your faith and trust in Christ, he changes you. He enters you in your spirit. He wants to work with you. He loves you. One of the things that I want to just mention is part of the reality of the process of redemption. I was talking with someone this week and they were sharing a story of someone who's going through great conflict in their life. And there's, the comment was made, well, they've said they're sorry and they said they're sorry and they said they're sorry. I said, have they ever said, please forgive me? There's a difference there. And when we come to the Lord and we say, I'm a sinner, I want to run my own life the way I want to run it. I don't want to submit to you. Please forgive me, Lord. That phrase changes everything. In our lives today, we want to today gather around these sacraments that speak of the broken body of Christ in his shed blood, and we want to Ask him to again forgive us. Not in the sense of being saved again, but in the sense of probably I've sinned this week. I've been selfish. Maybe my thoughts weren't pure. Please forgive me. Purify us as a body. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word given to us to teach us. And today as we've just done a very high-level view of all the things of Scripture that you have in store for us. What an exciting plan. What a delight to know that as your children, evil will eventually be totally vanquished. And we will live in a time of beautiful, perfect, sinless existence with you. Lord, thank you for dying for my sins. Lord, as your people, we want to again acknowledge what a loving Savior you are to come and have died for us. We thank you for all you've done and all you will do. Bless our time of communion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Russ is going to come and lead us in a song before we go to communion. <laughs>